Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we look forward to the things you're going to show us tonight as we continue through Hebrews chapter 11 and looking at these men and women of faith. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us these scriptures, and Lord, just to help us in our own walk, especially in the days we're living in. We just pray for our worship. We want to honor you and glorify you. And Lord, just may these songs minister to our hearts and just draw us close to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And we've been spending several weeks here in Hebrews chapter 11 as we're looking at these men and women of faith. And again, these aren't perfect people, but people who walk by faith and not by sight. And here in chapter 11 of Hebrews, God sees the faithfulness of these men and women. He doesn't see their failures. And we're currently in this last division of this letter, the superiority of Jesus over the principle of faith. And we're specifically looking here in Hebrews chapter 11 at examples of faith. And I realize some people wonder, well, why are we spending so much time in this section of Scripture that's been called the Hall of Faith? Well, first of all, we need to know what faith is all about, and it encourages us as we're faced with various situations Look at what happened before. Look at what these men and women did. We should do no less. Also, you have to understand, Paul is writing to uh, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who are being drawn back to Judaism, back to the rituals because of persecution and seeing the magnificence of the temple every day. And all these were drawing them back to the law. And again, what in the world does this have to do with why we're spending so much time here? Well, again, like I said, look at the days we're living in, with all the pressures of the world, of family, of friends, maybe, you know, drawing you back to the old ways, moving you away from Christ. And Paul wants us to understand, through the Holy Spirit, that we need to anchor our life in Christ. There's no one or nothing that will save us except Jesus. And really, where else are you going to go when Jesus has the words of eternal life? I mean, that's what we need to think about. Yeah, everything looks crazy out there, but where are you going to turn to? Who are you going to turn to? I mean, really, are you going to turn to CNN? I mean, come on. No, you turn to Jesus because in him we have peace and comfort and hope. The world doesn't have that to offer. Remember what Paul said in, in Romans 10, 39. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And again, he's trying to encourage these Jewish believers not to fall back into the rituals of Judaism, but to consider Jesus, to take hold of the substance and not the type or the picture. And here are just examples of faith. What the Old Testament saints endured for their faith. And we should do no less since Jesus has come, the Messiah has come. You see, keep in mind, they look forward to the coming of Messiah. All they had were the promises of God. We look back and see that the Messiah has come. The finished work was completed by Jesus, and so we should walk by faith, trusting in the promises of God just as these dear saints did, awaiting for the Messiah to come. And we've looked so far in our study the Obedient faith of Abel, who still speaks to us from the grave. We saw the faith of Enoch and how he walked with God. The faith of Noah and how he built an ark for maybe 120 years based only on the promise of God that there was a coming judgment upon man by a flood. We saw the faith of Abraham and saw how it matured. And we concluded last time looking at the faith of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Tonight, we're going to look at the faith of a family, of a man, and a, really of a nation. But mostly, the focus is going to be on the man, Moses. And to the Jews, this was their deliverer. Make no mistake about it. You know, we think of him as Charlton Heston, but no, Moses was a real guy. And the, he's the one that brought them out of their bondage in Egypt. He was their lawgiver. And so this was an important person in the minds of the Jewish people. And again, that's who he's writing to. And they needed to understand that this lawgiver walked by faith. He lived by faith and not by the law. Was he obedient to the law? Of course he was. But his faith was accounted to him for righteousness, not the keeping of the law. You see, God's ways has always been faith, guys. And we'll see that tonight with Moses, the lawgiver. Now, let me share this with you to show you what 
the Bible says of this man, and I think you'll clearly see why the Jewish people saw Moses as one of the greatest men of all time in regard to the faith. This is what we're told. The book of Deuteronomy ends with Moses' unparalleled epitaph. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all the, those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. To all Jews, Moses was the greatest of all men. According to one early tradition, Moses had higher rank and privilege than ministering angels. He was Israel's greatest prophet. God communicated directly to him and testified regarding their relationship. What a prophet of the Lord is among you. I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. That's why his face was luminous when he descended at Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. He was Israel's greatest lawgiver. Virtually everything in their religion recalled his name. He was Israel's greatest historian. Moses authored everything from Genesis to Deuteronomy. He was considered Israel's greatest saint, for the scripture says he was more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. This perhaps most amazing of all, because of those who have accomplished great things, are anything but humble. But Moses was the humblest of the entire human race. He was Israel's greatest deliverer. His feats are wonderfully chronicled throughout the book of Exodus. Significantly, in regard to Moses' deliverance of Israel from Egypt, his liberating work was a huge act of faith from beginning to end. And this is what the author of Hebrews focuses on in verses 23, 23 through 29 in the Great Hall of Faith. Here we have the anatomy of faith that delivers others and sets them free. This insightful teaching had special relevance to the ancient church suffering in its own inhospitable exile in the Roman Empire. Certainly this section has direct relevance for every believing soul who senses any conflict with the unbelieving world. Moses' faith is conveniently explained under five brief sections, each successfully introduced with by faith. Notice it doesn't say by law. It's going to say by faith. And we see that throughout here in the book of, or in chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's always by faith. So with that as our introduction, let's pick up reading in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 23, and see what the Lord has for us this evening as we Look at the faith of Moses and his parents uh, and how we can apply these things to our lives. Paul wrote this. He said, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Again, the chapter opens up, or this section opens up with the words, By faith. And we see it 18 times here in Hebrews chapter 11 because, again, it was by faith and not by works. They look forward to the promise of the Messiah, even though they didn't see this come to pass in their lifetime. But again, it was all by faith. And before we look at Moses, Paul wants us to see the faith of Moses' parents, Amram and Yachbed. And it's been a few years, actually some 12 years, since we studied the book of Exodus. So I'll kind of fill in some details of what was going on here. So we don't lose sight of what their faith was all about because what they did was pretty remarkable. At this point, the Jews have been in Egypt now for over 300 years. Their numbers have grown. Maybe they're, they're somewhere between 1 to 2 million people or more. And as new kings came into power, kings that didn't know Joseph, they were afraid of the Jews turning against them, especially in war. And this is what we're told in Exodus 1, verses 7 through 14. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mightily, mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war, 
that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and brick, and in all matter of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Again, things weren't going well for the Jews down in Egypt. And the Egyptians were worried because they kept multiplying these Jews. God was blessing them. Their numbers kept growing and making them slaves and forcing them to work with rigor didn't help. So the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives and said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then he shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So again, serving with rigor didn't stop their numbers from growing. And here's the second plan. And it didn't work either. He asked these Hebrew midwives to kill the Hebrew males that are born. I don't know how you do that. But they couldn't do it. They weren't killing them. And they said, the Pharaoh asked why, and he said, they said, well, you know, they're just born before we get there. You know, these Hebrew women, they just pop them out, I guess. And so they're already born before we get there. I don't know if that's a a great reason, because Pharaoh could have said, well, why didn't you just kill them after they were born? But he didn't. And Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Okay, so the midwife thing didn't work. So now it's the responsibility of a family. You have a son, you got to throw him in the river and drown him. Wow. I mean, how cruel, how evil. Well, I guess we need to look at our own nation. 60 million children murdered in the womb. So, I mean, are we any different? And I'm sure Pharaoh thought, you know, if they don't do this, then all their children are going to be killed. All the the girls that are born, not only the sons. So this is kind of an incentive. And that brings us to this Levite family. Amram was a godly husband, so too was his wife. She loved the Lord. And prior to all this turmoil, they had a daughter named Miriam, and they had a son named Aaron. This was all before Moses was born. According to Exodus 7:7, 7, 7, Aaron was three years older than Moses. And within those three years, this is when that edict was established by Pharaoh. And that's what Moses was born into. Every son who was born, Pharaoh said, of Jewish descent was to be thrown into the river and drowned. But this family refused. You know, well, why did they refuse? Well, it says because they saw he was a beautiful child. Now, we read that and we think, you know, so really, he's a beautiful child. I don't know. I, I have not seen any parent that, you know, the husband said, wow, hon, we have an ugly baby. Probably that would be the last thing he said uh, to his wife. But Really, I, I don't care how ugly the baby is. No one's going to say that's an uh, Oh, look at how cute he is, right? I think there's more to it than just being a beautiful child. I think God spoke to this Levite family and told them this child was going to be special. And they saved him by faith in what God had said to them. By the words of God, they obeyed. And we're not told, you know, how this was done. But the parents of Moses knew that God had chosen this child for a special purpose, to deliver the children of Israel out of their bondage. And the point is this. Biblical faith is always tied to a promise of God. That's something we need to remember. Biblical faith is always tied to a promise of God. It's something God has promised us. Our faith has to be tied to the promises of God or we're going to do things we're not supposed to be doing. And that's what we see here with Amram and Yachbet. 
They had this promise from God, biblical faith, and it caused them to walk by faith, to do those things that Pharaoh didn't want them to do, but God wanted them to do. Now, does that mean if they didn't hear from God, they would have killed Moses? I can't imagine how they could. I mean, that's the other issue. But again, the incentive, right? They had two other children, Miriam and Aaron. And if Pharaoh found out that another son was born to them now after this edict was established and they didn't kill this child, Pharaoh could have said, say goodbye to your other two children too. You're losing all your children. So that's kind of the incentive program. How many Jewish male boys or males were killed? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if any were. I mean, I don't know how you could do that. But I'm sure some did. And here this family is, acting in faith. And for three months they hit him until it was too dangerous. Maybe he was getting too noisy. You know how three-year-olds are. <laughs> they make a lot of noise, and it's going to catch someone's attention. So Yaakovid made an ark of bulrushes, sealed it with asphalt and pitch, was watertight, placed Moses in this little ark, floated him down the river where Pharaoh's daughter would bathe, and Marian, Miriam, Moses' sister, watched to make sure he would be safe and kind of watched to see what was going to happen. And here comes uh, Pharaoh's daughter. She sees this basket in the river, got her maid to go and get this little ark and bring it to her, and here she sees this male child. And in Exodus 2, 6, we're told this, when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew child, Hebrews' children. Now, how did she know? Well, maybe he was circumcised. I mean, that would be pretty obvious. Um, but this is what transpired in Exodus 2, verses 7 through 10. This is amazing to me. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Isn't God amazing? Maybe for some five years or so now, Yachbid, the mother of Moses, cared for her son with the approval of Pharaoh's daughter. And not only did she care for him, but she was paid to care for him. That's awesome, huh? She got wages for this. And I think during those five years or so, Yachbid instilled in Moses the things of God, how God had a plan for his life. And then she had to let her son go to give her child to the daughter of Pharaoh to be raised in an ungodly society filled with all the luxuries you could imagine, all the enticements you could imagine. He had the education, he had the wealth, he had it all. He was next in line to the throne being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was part of Pharaoh's family now. And let's think about this for a minute. Pharaoh was worried that the children of Israel would grow in numbers and finally rebel against him. So he gives an order to have all the baby Jewish boys killed. But look what God does. In his own house, he's raising the very boy that God was going to use to deliver the children of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. Well, does God have a good sense of humor? I think he does. What we're seeing here is that the parents of Moses accepted God's plan. What do I mean by that? They didn't try to circumvent it. They trusted that God knew what he was doing and they walked by faith. But it's a crazy plan. How in the world is this going to work out? What's going to happen? He's being raised by non-Jewish people, pagan people. Amram and Yaakov did not know how this was all going to play out. 
they were just told, and I believe they knew what their son was to do. They trusted God. They didn't have all the details. And so they had to walk by faith and trust in the promises of God. I mean, I think for each of us, it is hard as God tells us to do something, and he doesn't tell us how it's going to work out. He just wants us to walk by faith and do it. That's hard. And I think it's hard because we think, yeah, but what if we do this? Because this, this seems good. And we come up with our own plans, our own ideas, but we're very short-sighted. God sees the whole picture. He knows the beginning from the end, so he knows what's best for our lives. We don't. And thus, we, he wants us to walk by faith. Think of it like this. Imagine if I was going to get a paintbrush and improve on a masterpiece, the Mona Lisa. Say I'm going to improve it by touching some things up, putting a tattoo on her cheek or whatever. Would I make the masterpiece better? No, I would destroy it. I wouldn't improve it. And it's foolish for us to try and improve on God's plan. We're going to mess it up. We're not going to make it better. God's desires, or God desires us to be obedient, and that's what we see here in the life of Moses' parents. He wants us to walk by faith and not by sight, to trust in him. And, I, you know, I, we read these stories, and I think many times we lose sight of what these people did, the faith that they had. I mean, we have a hard time letting our children go when they're 18. You know, maybe not, but sometimes we do. Hard to let them go. Moses was given to the daughter of Pharaoh at a very young age. And all that Amram and Yachbid could do is trust in the promises of God to let go and let God work. So here in Hebrews 11.23, it kind of covers those, in a sense, 40 years of Moses' life. And as we read on in verses 24 through 29, it's really the next 40 years of Moses' life. So let's read on, see what happens with this child who is destined to be the next king or pharaoh in Egypt. Look at verse 24. Again, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Again, like I said, and this is so important, by faith. And this time it's Moses who by faith took a stand for God. Keep in mind, he's at the age of 40. He's ready to again to take this stand, to separate himself from the wealth of Egypt, all that the world could offer him and do God's will, join himself with his people. In fact, Stephen tells us of Moses in Acts 7.22, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. I remember years ago when we were back in Illinois, they had a King Tut exhibit, King Tutankhamun, king of Egypt. He was the boy king. And it was in one of the museums that was on display in Chicago, and all the riches that were buried with him, the gold, the precious stones, all these things entombed with this boy king. And he only lived some hundred years or so after the time of Moses. So Moses had it all. He had all this stuff before him. And Moses, our Pharaoh's daughter had no other children than Moses, whom she adopted. So Moses was next in line to the throne. And from a worldly perspective, he had it all. So to throw this away and gain nothing by leaving Egypt, from a human perspective, is ridiculous. But from a spiritual perspective, he gave up nothing to gain everything. And that's the perspective we need to have as we serve the Lord. We don't lose anything when compared to what we gain in Jesus. But again, think about what he's doing. Then place yourself in his shoes, or I guess sandals or whatever, Imagine all you could have. Imagine if you could have all the riches, all the power, anything and everything you wanted were at your fingertips. What would you do? Would you leave it all behind to follow the Lord? Now, we're not in that situation, so it's real easy to say, of course I'll follow the Lord. Are you ridiculous? But how many people are tempted by the worldly riches and drawn back? We even have examples in the New Testament of people who are drawn back into the world. 
but for the most part, none of us are going to be offered everything that this world has. But what about smaller issues? What about just being obedient to the Lord? And yet, in what he wants you to do is not what you want. Does that happen? Sure it does. It happens all the time. And if you obey the Lord, maybe, you know, it's going to hurt you in the position at work, maybe a position you were looking for. And now it starts to get tougher. And we can make all kinds of excuses why we didn't, you know, do what the Lord wanted. But it's not good. It's not right. And it's not going to help us. For Moses, it was, a, it was living the life of a king and then giving it all away to live a life of a slave. And here we are, some 3,500 years or so down the road from when Moses made his decision. And I wonder if you were to ask him today what he thinks about the decision he made. What do you think he would say? It was the best decision I ever made. Absolutely. You know, he followed the Lord in all that he went through. That was the worst it's going to be for him. And we have to keep that in mind as we live out our faith. We are never going to lose when we follow Jesus. And if you really think about it, when you look at all that the world has, I mean, look at some of these people. Let's just use Hollywood for an example. People that are, have all the, the riches, all the glamour, all the looks, all the everything they want. They're a mess. Their lives are miserable. They're not happy. They commit suicide. They're addicted to drugs. Is that what we want? I'm not saying the Christian life is easy. It's not. But this is the worst it gets for us. We're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Eternity. Wow. Moses separated himself from the Egyptians. And as he did that, he saw the heavy burdens being placed upon his people. And what did he do? He went into a phone booth, changed his clothes, and had a big D on his shirt for the deliverer, right? He was ready to go. He was ready. It's not exactly how it happened, but I think that's kind of how he felt. And as he's walking among his brethren, he saw an Egyptian fighting, beating up a fellow Jew. So he steps in and he kills the Egyptian and he buries him in the sand, the little mound in the sand. And maybe he thought, it has begun. One Egyptian down, probably a million or so to go. Be a little mounds everywhere when I get done. Wow. But... This whole idea of being the deliverer didn't last very long. The second day he comes out, maybe thinking to get a few more Egyptians the second day, and two of his brethren are fighting. Two Jews are fighting amongst themselves. He tries to break it up. And Moses realized, you know, that a people or kingdom divided wasn't going to stand, and he, being the deliverer, tried to stop it. And the response of the people was not exactly what Moses thought was going to happen. Because in Exodus 2.14, we're told of what, are the, what one of the men said. Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Wow. Don't you know I'm the deliverer? Come on, man. Moses is terrified now. Why? Because if Pharaoh found out that he killed an Egyptian, his life is on the line. And so he exits stage left. That's right, exit stage left. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, whatever. And he's in Midian for 40 years as a shepherd. Now, think about that. Wasn't this God's will for his life, for Moses, to be the deliverer of his people? Yeah. What happened? It wasn't the right time. Moses got ahead of God. Why? Because Moses needed to learn some lessons of faith before he delivered his people. He had to come to the end of himself, his strength, so he could depend upon God. Moses thought he was the deliverer. No, God really was the deliverer. He was going to work through Moses, but God was the one who was going to deliver the children of Israel. 
And Moses did step out in faith. He forsook everything of this world and focused on that which he couldn't see, that which he couldn't possess with his earthly senses, but he could with his eyes of faith, really the coming Messiah. Forty years go by. He's 80 years old. And God calls Moses. And Moses said, are you kidding me? He didn't really say that. But I could imagine. I'm 80 years old. Now you want me to be the deliverer? 40 was pretty good. I felt pretty strong at 40. 62, not as strong as I did as 40. At 80, I can't even imagine, okay? At delivering 2 million people or more from Egypt at 80? Camping all those years? I don't think so. But that's what God called Moses to do. And for a few chapters, things aren't going too well. Pharaoh's hardening his heart, putting more burdens on the Jewish people. And in Exodus 6, verses 1 through 8, this is what we're told. The Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, I'm Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard their groan the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and I will give it to you as a heritage I am Yahweh. Seven I will statements made by God here. And it, notice that nowhere does it says Moses, you will. Not at all. God has made these promises. He will bring them to pass. All Moses had to do was walk by faith to trust the Lord. And in Exodus 6, 9, Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Every day their bondage was increasing more and more. Egyptians were persecuting more and more, making their work harder and harder because of all that Moses was doing. And basically the children of Israel were saying, you know what, Moses, leave us alone. We were doing better without you. Now it's a lot harder on us. And for Moses, that couldn't have been too encouraging. What can we learn from this? Well, I think there's a powerful lesson we can learn here from Moses. When the world, when even sometimes the church is saying, you know, more is better, wealth, prosperity, possessions is where it's at, Moses is saying, no, the Messiah is where it's at. Those things are temporary. He's eternal. I'm looking to, to him. Psalm 37, verses 16 and 17. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Yes, Moses chose correctly. Absolutely. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, Paul said, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is for but a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We spend so much time on this outward physical body. And I guarantee you this. No matter what you do, no matter much plastic surgery or whatever you do to your body, it's still going to perish. It's just the way it is. Paul says a little exercise profits. It profits a little, okay? But are you building up the inner man? You see, how much time are you spending with the Lord? How much time are you spending in his word? 
building up that inner man, learning and growing. Yeah, don't lose heart. These things are temporary. Hold on to what's eternal. In fact, Paul said in Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Perspective is everything. It's everything. Think about it. These sufferings, when compared with eternity, they don't. This is, boom, it's over. Eternity is forever. That's the perspective we need to have. And as we have that, it, cause, it helps us to walk by faith. Okay, Lord, I am going to trust you. I realize that these present sufferings are short-lived, they're temporary, they will end. But you are eternal, and I will be with you in glory one day. Now, that's what Moses felt. He, he, he didn't hold on to all the riches of Egypt, all that Egypt had to offer him. Why? Because it's the passing pleasures of sin. Just passing. Here one day, gone tomorrow. And of course, there's pleasure in sin, or we would never get involved with it. But the key to all of this is that it is passing away. It never satisfies. Think about it. Money, does it satisfy? No. How much more do you need? Just a little bit more. I find that funny. Because you get the little bit more, it's, well, maybe just a little bit more. It'll never end. And you can place all kinds of sins there, like drugs. Think about, if drugs could satisfy, why do you need more or higher doses? Because the pleasures of those sins passes away very quickly. And you try to find more pleasure and more pleasure, and you can't. And outside of God, you're never going to accomplish that. It's never enough. What a joy we have in the Lord, the satisfaction, the peace, the comfort, and that everlasting joy that's in him. One writer summed it up like this. He said, It is acknowledged in this passage that sin is pleasurable. That is why people choose to sin. We're never forced to do right or wrong, but many times we choose to sin. We sin because we are enticed by our own lust. When we give in to these desires, we sin. While sin may be pleasurable, the pleasure of sin is temporary. That is why this passage speaks of the passing pleasures of sin. This is why people have to keep going back to sin. The pleasures that were derived from one sin does not last, so they have to go back for more. Ultimately, the pleasure will pass forever with no way to get it back. John wrote, the world is passing away and also it's lost, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. What should we do knowing that the pleasures of sin is passing? We should seek God and his reward regardless of the consequences. Moses gave up the pleasures of sin for ill treatment with the people of God. Why? He was looking to the reward, which was greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. There will be hardships and difficulties in living the life of a Christian. But in the end, the reward will be far more than worth. The reward will be more than worth it no matter what we face in the meantime. We are admonished to lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Oh, may we be like Moses. Look to the reward, look to Jesus, or as Paul put it, instead of seeking the fleeting pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward, and that's what we need to do. Well, back here in Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Why did Moses flee from Egypt 40 years earlier? Because he feared what the king might do to him, put him to death. Here he is now 40 years later. He comes back to Egypt, right? Not fearing this earthly king because he knew that the heavenly king would fulfill his promises to him. That's kind of what Solomon said. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man causes us to do things we shouldn't do. And in the end, it doesn't save us. Being obedient to the Lord, trusting in him and walking accordingly 
causes us to be secure. And it doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen to us, but we're secure in Christ and no one can take the Lord from us. We'll always be with him and he'll always be with us. You know, we'll see when we uh, go further on in the book of Judges that uh, Micah builds these idols for himself. He gets a priest to minister to him in his home. And one day, the tribe of Dan is come, comes up and comes to Micah's house. And they find these idols, and they find the priest, and they take them. And Micah comes after them. He said, why'd you steal my gods? He didn't really say it that way, but that's really what he was saying. You see, his gods were idols, and they could be stolen. Can anyone steal Jesus from us? Absolutely not. The Lord said, you're in my Father's hand, you're in my hand. No one's able to snatch you from it. We're secure in him. Wow. I, I love that about our God. We don't have to fear. You, you know when fear comes into our lives? When we listen to the devil. God doesn't love you. Oh, you call yourself a Christian. Look at what you just said. Look at what you just did. Look at your behavior. And you're a Christian. You're not a Christian. You're only fooling yourself. And we start to listen to him. Well, yeah, I'm not good. How could God love me? How could I be a Christian? And you know what the problem is? You're listening to the wrong person. You need to listen to God. In fact, Paul tells us, as part of our spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, put on the helmet of salvation. What does the helmet protect the warrior from? Damage to his brain, right? What is the enemy messing with? Our mind. Put on the helmet of what? Salvation. Oh, wait a minute. My salvation isn't based on how good I am. It's on, based upon how good Jesus is. Now, that doesn't give me a license to sin. But my salvation is secure in him. Remember what I said. You're in the Father's hand, you're in Jesus' hand, and no one's able to snatch you out of his, their hands. Really, who can snatch us from God? No created being. And Satan is a created being. Can't happen. Look at verse 28 here in Hebrews 11. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, Moses kept the Passover. And I want you to see how this all plays out because this is a step of faith on the part of Moses and the children of Israel. Remember the events in Exodus as Pharaoh kept waxing and waiting on letting God's people go. I'll let them go. No, I won't. Yes, I will. No, I won't. Yes, I will. Nine plagues were poured out upon his kingdom and he still rejected the request because he hardened his heart to what he knew to be true. There was the plague of blood upon the water supply, a plague of frogs that covered the land, the plague of lice. That's just creepy. I don't even want to think about a plague of lice, man. Then the plague of flies, which is not much better, but, you know, uh, I was in Montana during the fly season. They actually do have a fly season. And when they bite these flies in Montana, man, they hurt. And in the fourth plague, I want you to notice something different about it. In Exodus 8, verses 23 and 24, it says, I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of the flies. Not in the houses of the children of Israel. God showed them he can differentiate between his people and those who were not his people as he poured out these plagues. The fifth plague was pestilence upon the livestock of the Egyptians. Sixth plague was boils on man and beast. Seventh plague was hail. And in Exodus 9.26, we're told only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Can you imagine that? You know, it should have been a wake-up call, right? Hey, wait a minute. They're not getting anything. We're getting plummeted by these hailstones. No. 
Eighth plague were locusts. Ninth plague was darkness falling upon the land. It was so dark it could be felt. And maybe, you know, these plagues were against their gods. This was probably an indictment against the, their god Ra, who is the god of light. I'll show you. I'm turning off the lights, God said. Um, and the tenth and the last plague was the death of the firstborn in all the land. But there was an exception. If the blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the doorpost and the lentil of their house, the angel of death would pass over that house. The firstborn would not die. And this was the beginning of the Feast of Passover. And Moses, by faith, instructed the children of Israel to apply the blood. And by faith, they did so. And the blood, I believe, formed a picture of the cross as they put it on their doorposts and on the lentil. And in Exodus 12, verses 29 through 36, this is what we're told. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord, Yahweh, struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders, and now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them whatever they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. What's interesting is all those who thought that this was foolish, those who didn't apply the blood lost their firstborn, and this loss was so great in the land of Egypt that they called for the Jews to get out of town and get out now. Isn't that true today? People go, oh, the blood of Christ, yeah, that cleanses you from your sins, give me a break. That's foolishness. And they will die in their sins. Unbelief. And what's amazing is, these are slaves leaving, right? The Jews were slaves, they're leaving and they asked the Egyptians, hey, could you give us some silver, gold, you know? And they plundered, it says, the Egyptians. Not with swords and spears. The Egyptians just gave it to them. Why? Maybe God was paying them back for all their years as slaves under the hands of the Egyptians. Hey, you didn't get paid all those years. We'll fix that. We'll even the score here. And he did. But it took faith to believe that the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and lentil of their homes would save a household from the terror of the angel of death. But Moses had faith and led the nation in observance of the Passover. The nation was walking by faith here. And like I said, there are many today who see the shedding of the blood of Jesus just as foolishness. But are they any different than these Egyptians who died by the hands of the angel of death? No. In fact, Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So, by our own righteousness, we can never stand before a holy and righteous God. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. But if we apply the blood of Christ to our lives, if we receive him as Lord and Savior of our lives, we enter into eternal life with him. Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. We apply Christ to our lives. We receive him as Lord and Savior. In a sense, the angel of death passes over our lives. We are not going to be at the great white throne judgment. We go before the beam of seat of Christ for our rewards. Huge difference. You could accept it or reject it, but both carry eternal consequences with it. Verse 29, here in Hebrews 11. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. The concluding by faith here for Moses. 
and it's related to the crossing of the Red Sea. This was a huge step of faith on their part. They had to walk by faith, and they did. I mean, think about their journey of faith. You know, after some 430 years down in the land of Egypt, they're heading home to the promised land, land they never possessed, but as the place that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're told 600,000 men plus women and children, maybe well over 2 million people in the Exodus, and Moses was the deliverer, leading them into a desert with no water, no food stops, just stepping out in faith and trusting in the promises of God. Now, understand that the children of Israel were not warriors. They didn't have any implements of war. They were slaves and they left Egypt and they didn't take the shortest route to Canaan. That would have been through the land of the Philistines. They went by the wilderness area by the Red Sea. Why did God take them the long way home? First of all, I don't think he wanted to discourage them by fighting against the Philistines, a very strong group of people. And I think there was something bigger that God was dealing with, and that was the Egyptians. If they would have went towards the area where the Philistines were, the Egyptians would have came after them too. So they would have had the Philistines in front, the Egyptians behind them. God had another plan. God brought them to the Red Sea. They, that was a huge problem. How do we cross it? How do you get two million people through the Red Sea? I mean, if you did it by boat, I mean, obviously it would take a long time to build big boats. So imagine two million people trying to cross this Red Sea. The other problem was now Pharaoh's coming after him. I guess he kind of thought, Hey, wait a minute, we lost all our slaves. Now we're going to have to do the work. This is not a good idea. And so he's coming after the children of Israel. He's mad at them. And so the Red Sea's in front of them. Pharaoh and his armies behind them. And there's mountains on either side of them. So where are you going to go? Now you're trapped. You're a caged animal almost. What are you going to do? Notice what we're told here in Exodus 14, verses 3 through 9. We're told, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart, so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have you done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his army. And he overtook the, them camping by the sea beside pi Hararoth before baal Zephon. Now, those Hebrews seeing the hand of God upon their lives, these men and women of faith, how did they respond to this situation? Keep in mind, they're trapped. Nowhere to go. In verses 10 through 12 of Exodus 14, this is what we're told. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and beheld, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, to Yahweh, and they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said, Lord, do you have another group of people I could lead? No, he didn't say that. Moses said, don't make me turn this camel around, boys. Don't make me mad here. No. What the children of Israel said was not exactly the response, again, that Moses thought he would get from his people. This is not an example of faith. 
They were ready to kill Moses. What did you do? We're better off in Egypt. And Moses could have said, guys, if you want to go back, go. Pharaoh's coming after you. But Moses didn't do that. I like that about Moses. In verses 13 through 15, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, which tells me they were terrified. Stand still. Don't run away. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord Yahweh will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And, and Yahweh said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. I like that. Stop talking, Moses. Start walking. Okay? You can talk all you want, but now you need to walk by faith. And Moses is like, man, guys, see the salvation that the Lord's going to bring here. This, Moses was a man of faith, but not exactly. Because he told them to trust in the Lord. And the Lord said, Moses, stop talking and start walking, like I said. And he stretches out his hands, lifting up his rod. Remember Charlton Heston? I'm sure he got all pictures in our minds, grew up watching this movie. And the waters split apart. Now, when this movie was made, The Ten Commandments, Think about the technology. And when I saw that as a kid, seeing those water, I was like, wow, is that awesome? 30 feet high on either side. Walls of water. And the ground is completely dry. And they were able to cross through. But they had to walk by faith. Think about that. You got these waters of water, 30 feet high. Could you imagine the noise that's being made? God says, okay, now walk through. Uh, Maxine, you go first. <laughs> right? Let some people go. Let's test this out and see what happens. They all went through. And really, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God, lighted the way for the children of Israel to pass through during the night and into the morning. What's interesting is for the Egyptians, it was dark, a dark cloud. They couldn't see, and it hindered their advancement against the children of Israel. And as the children of Israel cross through the Red Sea, the Egyptians enter in. God kind of loosens the bolts on their chariots, which I think is hilarious. You know, the wheels are wobbling. I'm like, oh, man, I'm never going to that chariot station again. Look what they did to our wheels when they fixed them. Horrible. And as they're going through the Red Sea, they're in the midst of the waters. The waters came down upon them and killed every one of them, including Pharaoh. In verses 29 through 31 of Exodus 14, we're told, The children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord Yahweh saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord, which Yahweh had done in Egypt. So the people feared Yahweh and believed Yahweh and his servant Moses. What a story. What's interesting to me is today people try to figure out how did this happen. They say, well, it wasn't really the Red Sea, it was the Sea of Reeds that they crossed. And the Sea of Reeds is not very deep. And if you get a strong enough wind, it could push the water a little bit. So it kind of moves the water away and they could walk through. But it'd be kind of muddy still. And I've read some commentaries on this and I just shake my head. And they miss another big miracle. How did the entire Egyptian army drown in three inches of water or a couple inches of water? I mean, how bad a swimmers are they? They don't think about that, but they're trying to negate the miracles of God. Can God do that? Absolutely, and he did. You know, I just believe what God has said. I don't have to figure out how he did it. When Jonah was swallowed by a whale, I believe he did. And I have assurance from Jesus, because Jesus said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Jesus confirmed that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Why would I doubt that? 
If I doubt what Jesus said, then I'm in trouble. And he's the word, so Genesis through Revelation, I'm going to trust him on it. The faith of Moses, parents we've seen this evening. Trusting in the promises of God. Faith of Moses to separate himself from the wealth of this world and to look to future rewards. Wow, that, you know, that just boggles my mind. Because the wealth of this world is dangled in front of so many people and they go after it. Just go after Jesus. And really the faith of the children of Israel, the sprinkling of the blood on the doorposts and lentils, walking through the waters of the Red Sea, they trusted God. It wasn't great faith, but they had faith. Not perfect faith, but growing faith. And I think, well, what does this have to do with any of us today? Well, think about it. As the enemy seems to be closing in, as things are heating up, as there seems to be no escape, God's saying, don't fear. Don't become angry. Trust in my promises to you and walk by faith and see the salvation that I will bring in the situations that you will face in this life. It says, Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Stand still. Don't be afraid. God's going to work. I like that. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 11 through 13 said, Now all these things happened to them as examples and were written for admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God is not looking to destroy us, but to stretch our faith, help us to grow. He wants us to trust in him no matter what we face in this life. I mean, if we really think that, you know, COVID is a big deal, we haven't seen anything yet. I mean, look at what Facebook and Twitter are doing. I mean, th this is just the tip of the iceberg. And it's going to get worse. And you know what I say? Lord, what do you want me to do as we go through these times? How do you want me to handle this? What do you want? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Because I guarantee you that no matter how difficult the person get, persecution gets in this country, God's still on the throne and he's still working. He still wants people saved. And how does he save people? Look in a mirror. It's through you, through me, going out and witnessing of our faith. Yeah. We have choices to make. To obey God or not obey him, to be filled with his spirit or to quench the spirit. But man, if you believe and trust in God and his promises, just walk by faith. And really, I guess we just need to hang in there, guys. You know, go into God's word for encouragement. Be in fellowship with brothers, sisters in the Lord for that encouragement in the days we're living in. You know, what's going to happen with the elections? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, if you look at numbers, Trump should kill this. But there's so many other factors involved, like all the ballots. I remember there was a story from Libya years ago that in this community that had 15,000 people, there was like 200,000 votes they had 15,000 people and 200,000 people voted. And it was all for the same person. Imagine that. That's incredible. What are the odds? Yeah, well, yeah, it's fixed. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't need to. He knows. He's in control. I, I trust in him. We're going to finish up this chapter next time. We'll look at Joshua and Rahab and many other heroes of faith. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, when we think of heroes of faith, we think of big successes, you know, that all these things are happening. But some of them died, were killed for their faith. Very interesting section, and we'll again deal with that next time. But 
Let me just close with this. What Paul said in Hebrews 11.6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We need to walk by faith and not by sight, guys. And I, I guarantee you, when you start focusing on the Lord and his promises, it takes away that fear. Because whatever's going to happen to me, God knows. And he will lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. But there's always, he gives us that little mountaintop experience to get refreshed. But guess what? The work's down in the valley. Remember when, when um, Jesus uh, took uh, Peter, Andrew, and James, I believe it was, out to the, up to the Mount of Transfiguration? And what did Peter say? Hey, Lord, let's stay up here, man. We'll build a couple of condos. This is a great place to hang out. And, you know, God didn't even acknowledge that. And they come down from the mountain. And what was down in the valley was a father who was out of his mind because his son was demon-possessed. He was being thrown into the fire and into the water. The father had to watch him continuously, and the other disciples couldn't help. I think Jesus' point was, boys, this is where the work needs to be done here in the valley, and it's not easy. We've got a demonic world out there, and they need our help. And we can't live on the mountaintop, even though it's a great place to live. We need to come back into the valley and minister to these people. We need to walk by faith and not by sight, trusting in the Lord all the days of our lives. Let's pray. Again, Father, we thank you so much for this section of Scripture, Lord. It's so encouraging to see that their eyes were not focused on the temporary, but on the eternal. They weren't focused on an earthly king, but a heavenly king. They were looking to the promise of the Messiah, the promise of the one who would truly deliver them from the bondage of sin that they were in. And that Messiah has come. Jesus has come. And we're so thankful. And we look back at those promises. And Lord, that should cause us to, knowing the work is finished, it should cause us to walk by faith. We have the Holy Spirit in us, empowering us to do the work. All we like the Old Testament saints, need to walk by faith. Help us, Lord. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.